who or what are you living for and why? What's the evidence that whatever it is you're living for is true? What, when you say living for, you mean... What motivates you through life? What is your ultimate in life? Who's my who do you ultimately trust? I don't, I don't know that I would say that there is a who that I ultimately what? trust. What do I who ultimately trust? Who or what? Trust? I mean, obviously you're a motivated person. Otherwise you wouldn't be speaking the way you do, dressed the way you do, and all. So obviously you're motivated, obviously you have priorities. No, I, so, I, I, what I, is your world view, you know? What, uh, are, what are you living for? I think that the, the best way to explain it is um, uh, naturalism. Um, I exist because I enjoy my life and I continue my life because I enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, I mean, there's an infinite number of things I'm living for, namely the fact that there's no reason that I would want to die because I'm enjoying what I have right now, especially since I don't, don't think that there's necessarily anything after I die. So, why do you think Albert Camus said the only question modern mo man must answer is why not commit suicide? Uh, well, um, Albert Camus definitely does not agree with any of the views that you espouse. Um, no, but I, have, I respect him highly. He was an atheist, a naturalist. Yes. And I think he was really getting at something in terms of, in light of the fact that you're going to die and be gone and become fertilizer or whatever, nothing well, that you do in life is meaningful. It's all meaningless. Well, at the expense of the fact that I, I assume that I will be mocked in a moment, um, I, the reason that I would not commit suicide is because there's determinism in the world and that what has happened causes what will happen. So everything's a necessary linkage of, of cause and effect, if you will. So when things happen, they happen because of uh, previous causes, and they're going to happen a necessary link of causes and effects. Therefore, there's not really a question of whether or not I'm going to commit suicide or why I should or should not commit suicide because there's, it's been determined by a necessary linkage of cause and effect. It's determinism, unrestricted causal determinism. If I were to give you a reason why I don't choose to commit suicide, that's because I enjoy my existence and because there's no reason that I would want to die and because if I died, I believe that that would be the end of all things. Therefore, speaking in a sense of any kind of rationality, I would prefer existing in, a, in an enormous amount of pain to not existing at all because at least I have some kind of existence that I enjoy. If we're looking at a determinist framework, right, we're looking at the fact that this is what I think it couldn't be otherwise. I couldn't think otherwise. It's happened because of a number of causes and effects in my life that are unrestricted and necessary causes and effects. Therefore, I'm not going to commit suicide, or if I were going to commit suicide, it would have already been determined by the fact that everything exists as a chain of causes and effects. So like you're a determinist? Yes, unrestricted causal determinist to be, to be specific. But yeah. I, I would believe with... Uh, so free will doesn't exist, right? Uh, yeah, well, I'm a, a compatibilist as well. I, I think that what you're, what we commonly... Okay, so free will is more or less uh, a custom. Um, Hume talked about it. Um, Einstein talked about it. Spinoza talked about it. Um, I mean, even, even Camus brings this up in, in some of his writings. I don't know how much you've read of Camus, but um, if you look at existence, right, um, it's a linkage of cause and effect. Right. And we can we can get down to the root of what caused something to occur by analyzing those causes, and then we can determine the effects from those causes. And thus, we could look at if we could look at all the causes in the world, namely if we could look at all the particles in the universe simultaneously, we could derive exactly what was going to happen next. And of course, we could do that for each instance in in existence, and then through that determine everything that's going to happen. Now, I'm a compatibilist, and Hume talked about this, in that we normally refer to free will as a sort of way to choose between um, this or that, right? And, and it has some aspects of, of uh, kind of covert belief in mind-body dualism, but more or less, we, just, we think that there's a, a, a way for us to decide, you we were kind of talking about it earlier, whether or not to do this or whether or not to do that. Now, I think that there is that decision. Now, that decision is affected by certain causes, right? When I decide to leave later, it'll be because I have to go write my philosophy paper, and that's due tomorrow, and because of that, I'm going to go to the union, I'm going to type up my paper, there were a number of causes that led, right? The teacher assigned the paper, why did he assign the paper? Because the university hired him and told him to teach a class, 
more or less there are millions of causes and from those causes we can derive what the effects are going to be, right? So my free will, my decision to go write the paper was because of these causes. So I do have will, right? And it is free, but that's compatible with the picture of causes and effects, right? So we have to agree that free will is making decisions based on options, based on based on causes, right? Or uh, based on circumstances. And we can determine what a free willing being would do based on those causes, right? So it's compatible with the picture of determinism, right? Now some people, some people um, ridicule determinism by, by saying that, oh, well, free will has to be an illusion if you believe in, in determinism, right? It is compatible with the picture. It's not an illusion in the customary sense that we use the word free will. Um, we can talk about it linguistically. We can get to Wittgenstein or, or, or um, other more modern philosophers, but more or less the way we use it implies that it can be compatible with the deterministic picture. Albert Camus made the decision to approach the minister of the American church in Paris, a man named Howard Muma, Methodist minister. Albert Camus and Howard Muma had discussions about meaning in life and purpose, and Howard Muma began to read the Gospels with Camus. And uh, Camus swore Muma to secrecy at that point in his life. And Camus, after reading the Gospels, got to the point where he turned to Howard Muma and said, uh, what does it mean to be born again? And what's baptism all about? And Muma said to uh, Camus that baptism is a sign of a spiritual birth, it's an outward symbol of a spiritual birth. And to be born again means to come spiritually alive to God. And Camus asked Muma if he would baptize him in a private ceremony. And Muma said, no, I don't think I, I can do that privately, because historically baptism has been a public statement of my faith in Jesus Christ. And so they parted company that summer, because Muma just served a summer pastor right there at the American Church in Paris. And uh, Camus said, I will look forward to seeing you next summer, mon chéri. And he left. Camus was killed in a car wreck that winter. At the end of his life, Jean-Paul Sartre said, quote, I do not believe that I am the product of chance, a speck of dust in the universe, but rather someone who was expected, prepared, prefigured, in short, a being whom only a creating hand could put here. And this idea of a creating hand refers to God. The Vedas and Upanishads. You can communicate truth through myth. Jesus communicates truth through parable. Parables are not <coughs> historical records of anything. They're stories. And Jesus communicates truth through stories. And that's what the Vedas and Upanishads are. And They're stories. It's, it's not a historical claim. It's a story. It's a myth. But truth is being communicated is the claim. Am I right or wrong? No, you're basically saying that what I believe to be God is a myth. No. What I'm saying is the avatars okay, I'm sorry, are communicated exactly in are mythological you refer to? narrative. The avatars are not space-time uh, people. Who exactly are these avatars you're referring to, may I ask? Arjuna. Um, like Shiva, Brahma, yeah. and, and you're saying those are, by the way, who I believe to be God, which yes. you claim are mythological characters. No, no, no. They're appearing on Earth. Them being seen. Mm -hmm is not an historical event. It's not the claim that these guys really walked the planet. It's more that they are spirits that exist, and they're the truth. And that's fine, I got no problem with that. But let's be honest, it's, it's not a claim of historicity. It's a claim that these spirits are true. Guess what, I've never seen God. But I believe God is true. But I would never say to you, God the Father walked on earth. No, God the Father walking on earth never occurred. It's not an historical event. Jesus Christ, God in human form, walked on earth. Right? Okay, so the avatars of Hinduism are not historical people who are born in a town, live, and then we have the historical record of them. They're mythological figures, but the point is, truth is being communicated through men. Right, but um, you then seem to be saying that truth is both true in the Upanishads and the Bible, which Actually, they're somewhat contradictory in some ways, at least. Oh, br brilliant. Absolutely. So now, we have a truth claim uh -huh. in the Vedas and Upanishads. Right. We have a truth claim in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. 
And obviously those two truth claims contradict well, each other. Well, actually they're mostly similar, but in key details they do differ, yes. Oh, come on. Well, all religions in the world promote good life. I mean, if I follow yes. any religion in the world, I, the society would be fine. It's, we just suck because we don't. <laughs> all right. But obviously, Jesus is saying there are not many gods. Jesus stuck to the monotheism of Judaism. There's one God. He repeated the Shema of Israel. Hero, God, hero <laughs> Israel, the Lord our God is one. Mm -hmm. and, now, obviously, that's not what Hinduism teaches. Right. So, how do you, you know, decide which one is more true? Well, that's what you got to do. You got to study the Vedas and Upanishads, and you got to ask, okay, is there evidence that supports the truth claims? Mm -hmm. And then you got to read the Gospels and ask yourself, is there evidence to support the truth claims of Christ? And what is the evidence that supports the truth claims of Christ? His sinless life, his incredible ethical teachings, his death on a cross, loving and forgiving his enemies, and his resurrection from the dead. Those four points. All right, but then that is equivalent to saying over the history of time, people who lived the way the Upanishads teach would cause just as good, you know, good being and good life. How is it that, and secondly, why do you say that he was completely sinless? What exactly is sin? Why are you saying, I mean, you claiming that he is sinless is like saying that I have my own idea of sin and he's adhering to it. Therefore, it's your own idea and not actually Jesus's. Fascinating point. No, sin is not something that I make up. Mm -hmm. Sin, justice, goodness uh -huh. flow from the character of God. And according to both the Torah and the New Testament, the goodness of God is revealed in the commandments, do not murder, love, do not lie, speak the truth, do not covet, celebrate with another person all the talents they have, do not be jealous or envious, build other people up. So sin is saying, God, your definition is wrong, my definition is right. Isn't that a circular argument though? Like saying, I know that Jesus was sinless because God said so and what God says is sinless, therefore okay. there's no basis for what is and is not sinless except for your own decision. No, the reason I answered you was because you said, Cliff, you're just making it up. No, 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 I'm not making it up. You read the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue right. in Exodus 20. Right. Can I interrupt you for a second? Uh, you're saying you knew what sin is and is not by based on Jesus' word, but you claim that Jesus lived a sinless life before you even had, and I mean, while he's living his life, you had no real idea of what sin is or is not. So how do you know that he lived a sinless life before he even told you? And if it's after he told you, then he can just suit it to whatever he did, and therefore he would be sinless. Jesus was a Jew. Right. And as a Jew, he believed that the Ten Commandments were from God, mm -hmm. from his Father. Mm -hmm. And he lived up to those Ten Commandments perfectly. All right. That was his definition of sinless. All right, and if I, for example, believed in something else, say, I don't know, like five commandments that I come up with out of top, or some other person comes up with, and I perfectly, and I strongly believe that that is the truth, and I perfectly adhere to it to my entire life, I can claim that I have been sinless. And so can other people who, you know, use that same argument, just because he was you and he followed through what he believed does not make him sinless any more than me following through what I believe would make you sinless. Right. But Jesus, as a Jew, insisted the Ten Commandments are the law of God. Right, and, and then he lived up to that incredibly high ethical standard. And if I insist, so what you're saying is if I insist on some incredibly high ethical <clears throat> standard, which again is, we don't even know what that high standard is or if it even is ethical, and then I just, you know, obey these laws that someone made, then you're claiming that I'm equally sinless as Jesus. I can promise you that if you espouse a very high ethical standard and then live up to that high ethical standard perfectly, I will respect you highly. That's why I respect Gandhi as much as I do. Because Gandhi lived up to a very high ethical standard very, very well, didn't he? But then, That's why I respect Gandhi. If Gandhi would have gone around with a racist attitude, if Gandhi would have gone around knocking people's legs out from underneath them, cut him off at the knees, I would not respect Gandhi as much as I do. We're coming back to, again, the argument of what is a high ethical standard, because we don't know what sin is or is not without these high standards that we aspire to, and we're making up these standards or somebody okay, good. Is. My argument is that you understand by exercising your conscience in a rational, responsible way, mm -hmm. you have a very good understanding of what is right and wrong. And that is why if I go up to this guy and smack him in the face, you're going to say, whoa, <clears throat> what are you doing? And if I go up to this guy and steal his backpack, you're going to say, whoa, what are you doing? And if I exhibit a racist attitude towards you, you're going to say, whoa, time out, what are you doing? 
See, you have a conscience that ties you into those Ten Commandments, that ties you into the teachings of Christ, the same way I do, the same way everybody does here. I don't think you need to have a PhD in the Bible to know that the rape of a woman is absolutely wrong. I think you've got a conscience that will inform you very quickly that rape is wrong. All right, so you're saying that, for example, the, him, you stealing the backpack would be kind of wrong, right? I think you but, would believe that. Right, wrong? but not necessarily. Good. I mean, property, again, is a concept that is inherently selfish, for example. Okay, we disagree. Um, so, for, and I'm just, not necessarily my point here, but say communism, for example. No, I you mean, speak for yourself, though. Come on now. Oh, I don't, no. I don't want to debate with Karl Marx. He's dead. I want to debate or talk with you. Okay? So is Jesus. We're still discussing No, no, him. Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. That's different from All Karl All right, Marx. then where is he now? I don't see him alive. Where is he now? He's in heaven. All right, so... He's going to come back a second time. And... Jeez. All right, um, so we're... Where are the avatars? You know what? Okay. <laughs> that point is obviously not going to get anywhere, and I'm going to get irritated by it, but... Well, if you want to shut down and get irritated, that's your decision. All right, fine. What are we arguing again? Because you seem to be... I think we're done. You on. don't know where we're talking about. I think we're no, done. No, I don't think we're done yet. Oh, okay. Well, then give it to me. What do you think? All right, so your issue of theft here, you're assuming that uh, that's wrong, right? Yes. But that's in the case of our society. For example, if uh, communism worked out well, and uh, the proletarian dictatorship actually you know, passed through and moved on to the rest of the stages of Karl Marx's supposed philosophy, um, would property and things like that would not exist, and there would be no such thing as you taking it from him, you're just use, utilizing it for whatever you need. It's not necessarily theft. No I offense was, to Adam Smith, no offense to Karl Marx. My view of stealing his backpack as being wrong has nothing to do with communism, has nothing to do with capitalism, no offense to the U.S. Supreme Court, it has nothing to do with the dictates of the U.S. Supreme Court. The reason that I'm convinced that stealing his backpack is wrong is not because him having a backpack is selfish. Rather, he's a human being created in the image of God, which means he has dignity. Because he has dignity, I need to respect him. And one of the ways to respect him <laughs> is to respect the property that belongs to him. Well, Therefore, is, uh, stealing his backpack you is to, wrong. Um, you seem to be believing that property is an inherent right to people, uh, that pro people have a right to property, then that right, pe property is something that belongs to me. Why could you, can't you say that everything belongs as a society to someone? <laughs> And everything then, belongs to sorry, society? Everything belongs to a group of people. For example, a family, you can own stuff, and it's not really theft if people utilize it. I'm saying this idea of theft is not necessarily wrong, because the idea of theft would not necessarily exist in a different society. Okay, so, or a good point. So what are you, so is this what you're saying? Right and wrong are determined by culture, by society? In a sense, yes. Okay, then I'm going to give you an illustration. Nuremberg Trials, mm -hmm. 1945 to 1949. Mm -hmm. 24 Nazi war criminals mm -hmm. are defended by Nazi lawyers. Mm -hmm. The Nazi lawyers inform the judges at the Nuremberg trial, you have no right to condemn these Nazi war criminals because they simply were carrying out orders. Mm -hmm. They simply were doing what their culture taught them to do. Mm -hmm. The trial shut down because those brilliant Nazi lawyers were onto something. If it's true that culture defines right and wrong, uh -huh. there is no way for the Allies to judge the Nazi war criminals because it was their culture who taught them that the Holocaust was good and they were just following orders. Robert Jackson, the counsel for the American contingent, stood up and said, there is a law above the law. And because of the law above the law, we can judge these Nazi war criminals as doing something wrong. And the trial continued, and those 24 Nazi war criminals were judged as having done something wrong. Right. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, that makes sense, except that I disagree that just because uh, someone else culturally believes that what they think is right does not necessarily entitle them to do whatever it is they want in the sense that, for example, I have my beliefs, and as a society, the um, United States has a set of beliefs, and if they're not willing to carry out these beliefs because the other culture, for example, the Nazis killing the Jews, is still deemed wrong in our culture, and as such, we punish them based on what our beliefs are of right and wrong, not what their beliefs are, because if we always assume that what they think is right is right, then we won't be able to get anywhere. But as a society, we agreed that killing the Jews is wrong, and as such, we punish them. But Robert Jackson's whole argument was there is a law above <laughs> but a nation's law, there is a law above a cultural law, and that law obviously rests in 
the existence of God. Because the only way there can be a law above a cultural law is if there is some type of mind prior to the human mind that creates and defines right and wrong. And I'm saying that that natural above law is unnecessary. And I don't see why it's necessary to judge these people. They, in your belief, okay, the people who are punishing are the ones who are, have been put into authority by society. And society as a whole decided that that is wrong. And as such, we decided to judge them based on what we decided is right or wrong. And how does that necessitate a higher law? My experience is that people can follow their conscience instead of following their culture. And we have the utmost respect for people who follow their conscience, Our which ties them into a law above the law, and they critique their culture. And we have the utmost respect for those people, don't our we? Our laws and or even though I guess you can say culture, but our constitution, for example, was an intellectual effort, not some kind of just uh, saying, I'm going to appeal to this natural law concept. It's uh, intellectual effort to say, this is what I believe, using my own conscience, is right, and I'm going to write it down on paper and make it the supreme law of the land. And that is what we decide to follow, consciously, not based on culture. You don't think the U.S. Constitution was based on natural law and divine law? It, that's what they claim, technically, yeah, but it does not mean there's not a conscious effort. Oh, it was definitely a conscious effort. Absolutely. Um, so what was your response to the reason for no necess not your argument for the natural law existing? I said that it doesn't need to be there, and you seem to be thinking that it does. I think every one of us here understands from the illustration that I gave from Nuremberg mm -hmm. that indeed there is a law above the cultural law. If my culture says that black people are three-fifths the value of white people, I can follow my conscience and I can follow my reason and figure out that no, that's an unjust law. That was Dr. Martin Luther King's argument in his letter from a Birmingham jail in Alabama. He wrote to the white Christian ministers in Birmingham, Alabama, and he said, guess what, fellas? The law of the land that you are commanding me to follow, that black boys sit at the back of the bus, that black folk have to drink from different water fountains? Well, guess what? The law of God is above the law of the land, the law of this culture. And you guys as Christian ministers, even though you're white, should realize that those laws are racist and they're wrong. So from his prison cell in Birmingham, Alabama, Dr. Martin Luther King was appealing to a law above the law of the culture, the law of the land. And I think that makes a ton of sense if all of us here are willing to think about it. Guess what, guys? The only way there can be a law above the cultural law is if there is some type of God who creates and defines that value of justice that that law expresses. So what you're saying is that by using my conscience, I'm somehow going to arrive at this natural law? Correct. And how is that different from saying that is simply my reason dictating what, it, what I decided to be just and not necessarily written by God? Well, you can do that, but I don't think you can live it out. Because if you're going to live out what you say you believe, you're going to have to acknowledge that if I steal his backpack or if I make a racial slur against you, that's not wrong in any absolute sense. Maybe it's wrong from your perspective, but obviously from my perspective, it's right. So your moral relativism crosses you out of the picture when it comes to making an objective moral decision. Because right. everything's relative. I would agree that what you did is wrong, and I would agree that if from your perspective, what you did might be entirely right. But that's not going to stop me from punishing you because that is what I believe is right, and I'm going to fight for my beliefs. But if it's relative, why are you going to fight for your beliefs? Because that is what my belief is. Yeah, but it's relative. It's not real. Uh, okay, relative. Why would you fight for something that's not real? Why would you claim that just because it's relative, it's not real? Because that's the definition. The definition of relative is, it's not real, it's simply a personal prejudice not true. ethic. Relativity true. means that what can be true for me can be equally true for you. It's not true. Yes, it, it is. It is not true. Have you taken a modern physics class uh -uh. recently, by the way? Just wondering. You cannot say that it's not true if you believe that it's relative. In the area of ethics and morals, if you're going to say it's relative, then you can't say it's really true or really false. You have to say, from my perspective, it's true or false, but my perspective is just my own personal prejudice and bias, my own cultural prejudice. You cannot say, if you're a relativist, it's really evil that a young child be abused. You can't and say that. I'm saying and that consistent. that's not entirely true. I have formulated, using my own thoughts, a belief system that I believe will lead to just justice and whatnot, and I will follow said belief regardless of what your perspective is. Yeah. 
And your perspective, if you believe what you say is, it's all relative. Justice is totally relative. Well, if justice is totally relative, why on earth are you going to enforce your definition of justice upon other people who disagree with you? Because from my perspective, you are unjust. Yeah, but if you believe that's relative, that justice is relative, <clears throat> what, where do you get off being so arrogant as to enforce your definition of justice on me? Because I am confident in my belief that what I believe is to be the correct belief. You're a confident, arrogant twit then. Yes, I am <laughs> arrogant. Everything you do is based on arrogance. If you no, think it is you not. Do Absolutely not. All right. If you are convinced that God created this man with dignity and value, I'm then sorry, you have a basis is... for understanding that to murder him, to steal from him, is absolutely wrong. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with my opinion. It has nothing to do with my culture or my cultural superiority. Nothing, nothing, nothing. It is totally wrapped up in the fact that he has innate value, he has innate dignity, and therefore I am responsible to respect him, not to denigrate him. Go ahead and define dignity for me. If you're a relativist, why are you wasting your time talking to me? And by reason, I can argue and convince the other person to share my perspective. Fine. But if they don't choose to share your perspective, they're not wrong, you're not right. Because uh, no, it's all no, no. relative. They think they're not wrong. I think they're wrong. Yeah, but you are enlightened enough to acknowledge that everything is relative. So because you're so intelligent that you realize that everything is relative, you understand that ultimately nobody's right and nobody's wrong. It's all relative. I've been, uh, someone gave me some advice once. It's a, there's actually a proverb that says, if you meet the Buddha along the road, kill him. And I mean, to me, that seems to what you're doing here, uh, selling hope. And so, I mean, I think that it is our duty to you know, question all those supposed proofs and everything. The, um, the guy who's trying to sell you the path to enlightenment and truth is the guy you should be most wary of. I wasn't under the impression that I'm selling anything. Well, the books, I mean. The books? What I, uh, about the books? I thought they were selling books back there. Are you guys selling books back there? <laughs> the books are free. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you'd like one, go ahead and take it. I stand corrected. <laughs> Why did you jump to that conclusion? Uh, because I've seen, this is the first instance I've uh, been up here, this is my first year up here, first instance I've seen people espouse, promulgating, you know, God and all that, and in Houston, every time I'd see it, they were doing what the girl was actually just talking about here, saying everyone's going to hell, and I've just, I, maybe it was a personal vendetta against people trying to um, posit their own ideas, and sometimes I see people that are very clever at doing that, and I just want to be able to try to give them a good debate. Thanks for your honesty. Because I... You keep. You always ask every time someone gets off, uh, right before they leave, what they live for mm -hmm. and their view. And I believe the whole purpose is you, you, an individual existence. You can't look at it without the context of society. We've always had society, and the whole process, the whole existence, like what our purpose here is, what we're doing right now, the collective deliberation.